let me take a moment to point out a couple of things that were remarkable this week. Um, and from a very biased standpoint, um, our law librarian and her staff of three reopened the law library this week. Monday was the first day of some new and abbreviated hours, but it has been a year since our closure. And take a moment to thank these special people for the efforts that they've made to make this happen. Visit the website, learn more about the services that are offered. But Lori, um, who is our law librarian who's with us tonight, has spearheaded this effort to make this happen. Her staff, um, Michelle, Stephen, and Robert, have worked around the clock for months as they knew that this would be happening, not sure when, but that it would happen, and they were ready for it. We can't say how grateful we are for the work they've done, except to acknowledge them right now and the closest we have to a group of people who care enough about a law library to tune in tonight. So thank these folks, a silent thanks. If you meet them, tell them thank you, and know that we very much appreciate this. At the same time, I'd like to bring up our continuing program and invite you, if you know someone, if you hear someone who needs assistance from a lawyer, we have continued um, for the past months on Zoom to host lawyers in the library. Um, again, go to our website, take a look at this. Lori and her staff work to make this as easy as possible for people to sign up for this program. While there are a variety of um, folks that offer services and free clinics, I will comment that the lawyers in the library are pretty much designed to hit nice working folks who are trying to get home and may just have enough time to drop by the Civic Center to do this. Mm -hmm. It's every other Thursday. You're welcome, and we'd love to see you there. Tonight, we welcome Otis Bruce Jr., who comes to us from pretty much next door to the public defender's office and one floor up from the courts. This is a gentleman who has been involved in our county for quite a number of years and in the most impressive ways. Um, if it's possible to think of somebody as the anthropologist of the legal community in Marin County. He's worked as a volunteer clerk. He's worked as a legal assistant. He's worked as a deputy district attorney. He's worked as an assistant district attorney. He has volunteered in his community outside of work um, through recreational groups, through youth groups, through virtually anything you might hope to imagine. When you are walking with him, you are likely to be recognized because people recognize him. It's our pleasure to welcome somebody who is well regarded throughout the um, Civic Center and everybody who sees him does know him. And that is Otis Bruce Jr. And we welcome you tonight. Well, thank, thank you, Denise, and thank you all who are attending. And thank uh, Lori, Lori, a library, uh, a library director, uh, her staff, uh, Michelle, Stephen, and Robin, and the president, Chris Kirby, and uh, Denise, our trustee, and the other board of uh, members and community members who invited me just to uh, come speak to you during uh, the first week of the library's opening on the first Thursday uh, speaker series session that they have organized here. Uh, it's an honor to uh, uh, be a public servant in this county, north of the Golden Gate. Uh, it's an honor to say that I uh, live, play, stay, raise three of my five, uh, uh, three of my six children in Marin. And I've been in Marin County, connected to Marin County, working in Marin County, volunteering in Marin County, serving Marin County since 1986. Uh, that's 34 years. Uh, and practically half of my life and my career has been in Marin County. And I say I'm Marin County pride, uh, proud. Uh, this is my community, just like some of your uh, community that 
been you have those of you who have been here, worked here, raised your families here, decided to choose uh, this place as your place of residence. And uh, I've been uh, working with the DA's office, as Denise had said, in several capacities for many years. Uh, I started my career in Marin County as a volunteer. As some of you probably have heard uh, me speak before, I started my career in Marin County as a vo volunteer public servant. I'm, uh, I was literally a walk-on uh, county employee. Uh, when I came here, I had no friends, I had no neighbors that I knew, I had no family, I had no connection, I had no referrals. Uh, no one sent me here. I just made a decision when I was residing in Oakland that I wanted to do something different with my career as a lawyer. Uh, and one of those lanes of difference that I wanted to pursue was to be a trial attorney. And I came to Marin County and in my efforts to seek an opportunity, I realized that I had to volunteer with no pay, with a law degree in my back pocket to get my foot in the door in this county. And I started out with the county counsel's office where I was a volunteer law clerk. And I did that for almost a year. And they, uh, then I left the uh, county council's office and I went to the DA's office because my big goal, my big vision and dream for my, myself and my career, my family, was to be a trial attorney. And I chose to go to the prosecutor's office mainly because I, I at that time, being a child of the South, I was born and raised in, uh, in a hard time Mississippi, as Stevie Wonder would say. I was born and raised in racist Mississippi. I was born and raised uh, east of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, I've seen every form of racism, bigotry, bias, implicit bias, explicit bias that you can ever imagine in my lifetime. And that occurred when I was from the time I was eight until the time I was uh, 17 and a half when I left Mississippi. And that's East Mississippi. Uh, Law, uh, Law, Mississippi, Jones County is the county. And there was a movie made about Jones County, uh, um, maybe five years ago, The Free State of Jones. Matthew McConaughey is a star in the movie. And that movie is based on a true story. That movie is, 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 is made uh, about a little town called Soso, Mississippi. And that's the town where I grew up. And the storyline behind that movie is true. Uh, it, uh, it involved uh, a white male, a Confederate soldier that defected from the Union and, and took up with the black slaves and he befriended a black uh, slave woman and uh, they made babies and those, the lineage of those babies and families are still in that community right today. And some of that bloodline is in my bloodline. Uh, that was based, uh, the general was Newt Knight. So the Knights, the Bruces and the Joneses and the Sims are, are longtime families around in that area. So that's a little about with my story back in the South. So uh, prior to coming to California, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've done everything that you think a child can do to show uh, what it means to be disciplined, build a work ethic uh, from negative zero to where I am today. I've, uh, I've picked cotton, I've worked in the fields, I've hauled watermelons, hay, poor watermelons, tomatoes, Peas, beans, squash, uh, anything you could, anything that you see, with the exception of grapes and olives, that the that uh, uh, the residents in Central Valley do, I did it when I was growing up, and that didn't dis that didn't cause any despair to me because I was the oldest of six kids and my mother raised six kids in the South, and so I had a dream of being a lawyer and the passion of, of being able to speak in the churches and being supported by my elders who encouraged me to pursue my education and that I did. And uh, I went from Mississippi to California, went to attended San Jose State University, uh, went to law school in the Bay Area, 
graduated from law school and I realized that uh, I was from an area of the country where civil rights, the pursuit of rights, the pursuit of justice was germane in our blood, in our history, in our culture in the South. Uh, so in that, in that vein, that spirit in which I grew up around, I know my history very well. Uh, there's nobody on this earth can help me to understand what it means to be a black man in America. Uh, I don't. I don't need nobody to define that. I don't need to watch any movies about black folks, black slavery, uh, 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 black on black crime, uh, law enforcement relation to black males. I don't need anybody to tell me about that because I understand my history. I understand what's going on. I, I would encourage other people to be educated. So knowing that, I pursued law school, and as I say, I start off as a volunteer in Marin County. And when I got to Marin County and I pursued my career as a DA in Marin, I realized that there were no African-American government attorneys that I went back in my research and found out there were no African-American government attorneys anywhere in Marin County at that time. No black public defenders, no black deputy county council, no black deputy DA. And to my knowledge, there were no black city attorneys in this county. So being from the South, being that vision, that bullhead that you're gonna be an agent of change, I said, we're gonna have to change that. How can you have a county north of the Golden Gate uh, uh, connected to so many veins of diversity that exist around you in Contra Costa, Alameda, San Francisco, uh, uh, Solano County, and you not have the diversity and multiculturalism in your system in your community, in your leadership that you would expect to have. And, and Richmond is, what, three miles from Marin County? Across the Richmond Bridge in San Francisco. And there was, was a lack of culture and diversity to the degree that you would think it exists. So when I realized that, I really put on my agent of change hat, where I said, okay, I'm going to pursue me a career here. And my dream was to be a prosecutor. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, why I chose to be to pursue this goal. Um, uh, there were no black lawyers in the, in the area of Jones County and surrounding counties in Mississippi when I was growing up. I didn't know any, and there's very few today. But what I did find out in, in law school in the state of California, uh, when I got out of law school in the, in the mid eighties, I realized that uh, only 4% of all the lawyers in the state of California were a combination of African-American men and women. And I speak just specifically to, to African-American or those of African descent, my people. You know, I know there's other cultures where I have to speak to, to myself right now. So I saw those statistics. And when I realized in the late eighties, I said, well, if there's only 4% of uh, African-American attorneys in the state, that means that's a lot of work to do. Uh, on every front. And uh, Latinos were around the same numbers and women were around six or 7% at that time too, of all lawyers in the state. <clears throat> so um, that motivated me more to get involved in Marin County, especially when I saw that there was no black uh, uh, government attorneys in this building. And when I came to the DA, they gave me an opportunity. The district attorney back then, it was Jerry Herman. Uh, he gave me an opportunity that I took advantage of and I pursued aggressively uh, with tenacity, with a vision, with a goal, with a three-year, five-year, 10-year, 15-year, 20, 30-year goal of uh, pursuing a career. And, I, and I, that career opportunity came true when I got hired as a legal assistant and then I got hired as a DA, a deputy DA. And uh, my career has been only in Marin. Uh, I've only worked one in one lane of uh, uh, government work, or one lane as an attorney. My entire career has been 30 years plus, going into 30 years plus to date in Marin County. And I'm honored, and, and I thank you all. I thank the citizens of Marin and the community and those who supported me and mentored me and gave me guidance back then and now for that opportunity. Because believe me, as Denise said, I've been sharing the love around to everybody. I've been giving back and paying forward 
for my entire career. And uh, I made a point that I wanted to do that. I wanted to make sure that I mentored the students, I mentored the, the fathers and the mothers who feel that they were disenfranchised or they didn't have access or they didn't have anybody who would understand their story, understand their plight. I, I realized that uh, it was incumbent upon me to do that based on the opportunities that I've had for myself. So in, in, as Denise said, in my, I'm just giving you a little insight of me. Uh, as in my background, I've actually, um, I chose to get involved in Marin County in a civic, a civic engagement way on a volunteer level while I was developing my career in Marin. Uh, I'm moving up to be an assistant DA. And the reason I did that, ladies and gentlemen, is because uh, almost every community that I've lived in in Marin, uh, I've been on, my family were the only black family and my kids were the only kids, black kids in their class. So in every community, when I lived in, off of Northern Avenue in Mill Valley, and when I moved from Northern Avenue to up in Novato, over, over near the old Novato Hospital, and then when I moved to Pacheco Valley, you know, where I currently live, I realized that it was incumbent upon me to know the community in which I served, especially since I chose a career of prosecutor. And once I understood the purpose of being a prosecutor, when you stand up in court and you said, when I say Otis Bruce for the people, I wanted to mean that very sincerely. I wanted to mean that, that I really am standing up for the people in the county of Miranda State of California, but I'm also standing up for my family. So I want to make sure my family was safe in this county and that we would be able to survive and I would, we would feel welcome here. So I got involved. I got involved in many levels of civic leadership and, and executive nonprofit leadership. Uh, I've been the, I'm currently the president of the Marin Athletic Foundation, uh, organization that's been around 36, 37 years. Uh, I've been the board director uh, for the California District Attorney's Association. I'm currently a, a board director for the California DA uh, uh, Foundation, District Attorney Foundation. I'm a former president of our distinguished Grand County Bar Association in 2011. In that capacity, uh, there was a historic mark, mark that was made indicating that I was the first ethnic minority, the first African-American to ever be chosen uh, to lead the Marin County Bar Association. And I take pride in that because that gave me an opportunity to meet, to engage, to work with, to get to know Chris Kirby. Uh, I see Barbara uh, Brown, I know her face. I see several faces. I know her, Sonia Tanner, uh, Jonathan Freeman. Uh, I know a lot of uh, people uh, on, this, on this Zoom and on this county and on the court floor. But when I was chosen, selected to be the president of the bar, I made a point to myself in 2011. I said, well, I'm the president of the Marin County Bar. What kind of historic distinguishing mark would I leave in a positive way to, that, will mean, that will indicate my sincere commitment to giving back? And what I did was I found out that the Marin County Bar Association at that time was the only bar association in the Bay Area uh, in a very rich community where lawyers are very distinguished and some lawyers do very well. We were the only bar association, professional association that did not have a scholarship fund set up for um, uh, the, the, the uh, college bound students and the law school bound students or for the library, donation to the library or the children's uh, uh, center or those kind of public uh, opportunities where you make donations. We didn't have one. And so I made a point through 2011 that we were gonna create the first uh, Marine County Legal Education Scholarship Fund. And uh, you can talk to many people who are in the bar, they can tell you uh, how that it has evolved. And I'm proud to say it started off with 50,000 donated by the board and is now uh, is growing to 100,000 more uh, plus right today. And that's a great part of the bar's history. And I'm proud to have been instrumental in pushing that through in 2011. And that's gonna be a long time 
legacy of the Bar Association because they have helped so many college and I mean law school students since that inception. And coming back to the DA's office, um, I wanted to be a, a real servant and understand that this there's history in this building. Uh, and I don't need to mention the history in this building. Uh, you know, the history of this building goes back to the 70s, 1971. You know, the issue that's happened in this building, the shooting in this building, and working with law enforcement, working community. But the reason I chose to be a prosecutor, and I'll get more specific to this part, and I hope, I hope you can uh, bear with me to understand. Uh, in this modern day social justice movement, social conscious movement, uh, there are so many agents all over the world now who are vying for change on every level in the justice system. And they are very serious. They are so serious that they are pushing to get elected officials, legislators, and other uh, uh, leaders in position to influence change from the inside out. You've heard of the phrase systemic institutional racism and bias. That is real. Uh, it is real, uh, definitely real in, in Mississippi. It's definitely real in the Northeast. It's definitely real in some parts of Minneapolis. And it's definitely real in California. And you cannot exclude, uh, uh, if you take the United States and you split the United States in four pieces, you will find that there are four separate justice systems in this country. You know, the justice, how it's, it is administered, how uh, it is uh, processed, how people get access is totally different from Texas over through Florida, through North Carolina. It is totally different going up from the North Carolinas all the way up to Maine and New York and the East Coast. It is absolutely different in the Midwest and it's different in California on the West Coast. Uh, if you don't believe me, drive through Mississippi right now in certain towns at night, regardless of who you are, what your race and culture, and have an engagement with a local police or local sheriff, and they find out that you're from California, you would definitely be treated a lot different than a native Mississippi. So we have to understand that uh, California is no exception, and North uh, the Bay Area is no exception. So what? So the, pursuing a career as a prosecutor was very important because it has given me an opportunity to really see from the inside out how things work. And a lot of people don't get that opportunity. Uh, they want that opportunity. The kids want that education to pursue because sometimes the challenges are so great and the obstacle in the education and access and internship and mentorship and, uh, and, uh, and being able to apply for a job is really, really great. The obstacles are great. You have to be very competitive to get a government job now. It's very hard to get a, a deputy DA job or a deputy public defender job. It's very competitive. A lot of people who work in the private law firm, they, they, they really uh, uh, pursue opportunities to work for government agencies these days. And even more so now that there's a lot of effort and momentum in the public for social justice reform and equity and inclusion. So the you can have one job open in this office and you can have many, many, many applications. So I chose to work in this, this side of justice so I can be there as a representative of the people to talk to people about access, to talk to people like I'm talking to you now, to be transparent, to be inclusive, to be who I really am. Uh, uh, I work as a prosecutor, but before I became a prosecutor, I was a man. I was a father. I am a father. I was a husband. I was a, a, a mother's son, a mother's uh, oldest son. So becoming a prosecutor didn't make me who I am. No one in Marine County discovered me, you know, even today. If anybody's telling you that they found a black man in Marine County, he's a great man, and I've been here 30 years. And if they hear me speak or if they want to stand next to me and they think like, oh, he's a great person. No, I've been great all my life. And what makes me great is my giving back and paying forward. Because I can look back and I can tell you some of the ways that I try to help other people uh, get access to justice, access to job opportunities, access to housing, access to uh, 
of social services need while I'm working as a prosecutor. And I've done that through some of my civic and uh, leadership roles. And I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of that moment. And I won't, and I don't know if I will ever be able to have as in-depth opportunities as I have had in Marin County if I hadn't stayed here. And um, so in our office, we uh, uh, we do a lot of great work on many levels. And it's challenging for a small county. Marin County is a very safe county. It's a very accessible county. People want to come here, but you can't tell me that most people on the Zoom right now are not feeling safe. Uh, uh, we're not Oakland. We're not San Francisco. You can walk out of your house right now, and most of you are not going to fret of having a drive-by shooting incident happen right in front of your door. You're going to walk out of your house right now, and you're not going to worry about seeing uh, someone who may be uh, a victim of human trafficking walking the streets right in front of your door. You're not gonna walk out of your house and have to clutch your purse because you think that, oh, somebody might run up behind me or rob me. That's not happening. So we need to sometimes as, as, as blessed people as we are in Marvelous Moran, we need to step back and say, wow, we got an opportunity to show the rest of the world how things could be done. We got the money, we got the resources, we got the intelligent community, we got people who wanna be leaders and you need to hold your leaders accountable. Uh, elected or appointed or otherwise, and 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 realize how blessed we are. I do. Um, there's a reason why Marin County don't have high-rise buildings. Most most of the cities that have high-rise buildings are places where people can hide and drive and, and as as uh, perpetrators of crime. Marin County don't have a lot of high-rise buildings. Marin County don't have uh, um, billboards. There are no billboards in Marin County. If it, most people don't realize that you drive the freeway, you don't see billboards. You see a couple of uh, service signs where somebody put a sign on I'll clean the road or something like that. But Marin County don't have the billboards and arts or liquors and advertised and drugs and, and cigarettes. Look how blessed we are. So by having those type of uh, positive uh, community, uh, credits and, and uh, opportunities, that means we have resources to give back to other people. We have resources to make sure that there's no children hungry in this county. We have resources to make sure that every child is educated. We have resources to make sure that the word underserved don't, is not spoken anymore in Moran. I just, for the life of me, I can't understand why we continue to say underserved communities. Uh, uh, when you only have about 200 African Americans, or maybe 300 at the most, that lives in Marin City, and in the Canal area, you know, uh, and, uh, and Latinos are 16 percent of the county. They're spread out, but if you look at a small community, it's not but a few hundred or more. It's not that many in the Nevada and the Crossroads in Nevada and Hamilton. So it's, it's enough resources and opportunities for everybody to be an appreciated resident, appreciated a uh, participant in the in the in, in, as as people living, raising children. It doesn't matter how they got here. The fact is that they're here. And then, and, then, and the fact is that they're here and they're in our community. And we should embrace that. And we should have figured out how we can serve them on every level. So getting back to the to the DA's office, if you allow me as I give you a, a little more insight, uh, Chris had said, there is a little way I can play this little short video. Uh, can I do that now, Chris or Lori? Yeah, you could just share your screen. Okay, all right. Listen to this. There's been a lot of attention on district attorneys lately and the prosecutor's role in the criminal justice system. But you might not know all the things the DA does, the limits on the DA's power, and the ways the DAs have already been changing their approach to prosecution in recent years. The DA's number one responsibility is keeping our community safe. We do that in three basic ways that we call the three Ps. Prosecute criminals who break the law, work to prevent crimes from happening in the first place, 
and protect and support victims of crime and make sure their voices are heard. When you think of the DA, you probably think prosecutors. While that's a big part of our job, the power we have to hold criminals accountable is carefully defined by the law and our ethical responsibilities. When someone's arrested, we carefully review the facts and the evidence. We can only file the criminal charges we believe we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Our job includes protecting the rights of the innocent, as well as those we charge with the crime. Then, the case moves to the justice system, which provides checks and balances and accountability. Public defenders, criminal defense attorneys, and judges all play a role in how the case will resolve. Prosecutors alone don't determine a person's punishment if they're convicted. That's up to a judge and jury once we've proved our case. Our goal is always fair and equal justice for everyone, but also justice that's smart and reflects the needs of our society and the will of the people. As prosecutors, we also have the ability to give people second chances. That's why we work with special courts that steer people away from jail, still hold them accountable, but get them the help they need to break the cycle and stay out of jail. Help like mental health treatment, finding a place to live, or kicking a drug or alcohol addiction. We also support restorative justice programs that help offenders understand the harm that they've caused to a particular victim or community. That's one way we prevent crime, but there are lots of others. We work with youth to help them make good choices and stay in school. We support programs that help people who are coming out of prison to find jobs. And we let the public know how to recognize and report crimes like child abuse, elder abuse, sexual assault, and human trafficking. The third big part of our job is protecting and supporting victims of crime. In a typical year, the DA's office comes into contact with thousands of victims, and we help them in lots of ways. We help get them emotional support for the trauma they suffer from having a child or loved one murdered, or the emotional pain from a violent crime like rape. We help victims even when we can't file charges against the person who hurt them. We sometimes even use therapy dogs to help them testify in court and tell their story. Arf! We do all of this on behalf of you, the people. And we're accountable to you and to the laws of the state of California. Those laws are always changing to keep criminal justice priorities in line with changes in society and technology. We embrace reform, but we'll always work to make sure change happens in a way that continues to keep our neighborhoods and you safe. Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. And, uh, and uh, I play that so that you can reflect on the realities of how relevant that uh, whiteboard uh, three minute video is now. It answers a lot of questions uh, uh, about uh, what a DA does and what a real DA office of staff and prosecutors and investigators, what they should be doing. Uh, you know, the uh, accountability and following the law is very uh, 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 serious. It's a big movement now. I always have been a movement because the only thing that's constant in life, as you all know, we all know, is change. Some people don't want to see it, but it's coming. And that's the only thing you can guarantee that's going to happen. Nothing's going to remain the same. It's just like I, I now reappointed under our DA Lloyd Pagoli as assistant DA. That's a change in this office that some people probably didn't think would happen, you know, but it's a good thing that it happened because uh, Lori and I are a great team. And I see the county with a big radar. And I, I understand the county from Sausalito, Marin City, to uh, West Marin, to San Pedro Bay, to the North Bay Narrows in Nevada. And there's not too many people can recite the county like that. But that's important because it helps us in our training and development and working with law enforcement to, to see cases resolved and our decision to prosecute cases. So um, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that um, uh, to work for this office and work for you, the whole idea of um, uh, uh, accountability, keeping people safe. Uh, they talked about the three P's, prosecution, uh, uh, prevention, and protection. Uh, prosecution is just one leg. I think the two more important parts of that is the prevention and the protection, keeping us safe. And that can come by uh, different ways. And if we can educate the community, like I'm speaking to you now, you know, let you know that we work for you. You are the taxpayers of Marin County. 
You pay my salary, you pay Lori's salary, you pay everybody's salary in this office. We work for you. You know, that's just the bottom line. And we uh, work hard for you to try to make sure that you don't have to have those uh, uh, mouthpieces or, or, or criminal circumstances that some other community uh, face that you see on CNN and ABC and other, other, other uh, media, uh, forms of media that cause you to gasp for air and to cry, to pain you, to see something happening right across the Golden Gate Bridge or right across the Richmond Bridge, or right off of 37 going into Toronto County, or going up even towards Sonoma. And you see that and you, you think like, wow. And, and some people cry and they feel very uh, uh, moved to start doing something, to stand up and, and taking a stand. But you're standing up and taking a stand and you're taking one foot forward to be a part of, uh, uh, be an agent of change and an inclusive person has to be sincere and genuine, has to be someone that's uh, acting on passion, speaking with passion, and not going to stop until you can see some positive, proactive results for everybody. So uh, we take pride in our office of being a part of the criminal justice partners in this county. That is, a, there's a new movement going on now during the last year in COVID and, and moving slowly out of COVID. There's been an effort between the DA's office, the public defender's office, and the uh, probation department and the Department of Mental uh, uh, Health and Human Services to work closer together within our budgets and our staffing uh, on the court floor and in the community as we address a lot of the issues in Moran County. And I'm very proud of our office participation in that. As a matter of fact, our office lead on a lot of the initiatives that are out there right now that the other justice partners are joining uh, uh, forces with us. Um, another, another point is um, we have uh, several units in our office. Our investigation unit uh, has a chief investigator and I think he has eight uh, investigators on staff. There were a former or retired police officer. We have uh, our, uh, our finance person, our in-office HR person, and her staff. We have our legal uh, paralegals and professional uh, professionals who process all the legal documents. There are three of those. We have our victim witness services unit. We have uh, eight women uh, who are professionals on every level and professionally trained. And you can always look for them in the community doing outreach, civic engagement. And we will be doing a lot more coming up. Uh, and then we have uh, our legal support team. We have 14 staff in that unit plus a supervisor. Uh, and then we have 28 lawyers on staff who are dedicated prosecutors and uh, still uh, many of them are, are young and established in families and, and many of them live in this community. So they are definitely dedicated to this community. They're raising families. And they're trying to make a life for themselves, but they chose to be prosecutors. And uh, I'm very proud of how committed they are in the cases that are sent up by uh, local police agencies. We work with 13 police agencies in the county of the 13 in Golden Gate National uh, Park uh, Police Department is one of those 13 agencies that we work with and we receive reports from and review and uh, make uh, scrutinize, decide if there's, there's a prosecutor, prosecutable case out of their uh, police investigation. Some of the things that we're doing, uh, we are, uh, you know, I've been designated uh, by Lori, uh, which I'm very proud of, uh, to be uh, our social justice, equity, community programs and policy coordinator. I'm the student intern uh, and career development coordinator. I'm the program director of the victim witness uh, unit, those uh, distinguished eight women who are the victim witness advocates and counselors. And, uh, and I'm also uh, uh, over uh, the uh, legal support staff and I work with our two chief deputies. We have two chief deputies, Rosemary Slope and Dory Ahana, who are exceptionally talented and gifted and committed. Uh, each have been here over 25 years. Uh, um, so I'm just giving you an idea of what the staffing looks like in this county. And we have, uh, 
kicked off uh, quite a few uh, social justice related initiatives, given the realities that some of the laws that came out in October 2020 are basically uh, requiring DA's offices across the state to really do a deep dive and look inside their offices and their policies and practices and uh, keep the community safe, prosecute cases, but look at ways to save the taxpayer money by working through restorative justice measures, uh, community outreach and engagement, uh, mentor programs, uh, 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 being a community uh, a partner to some agency all throughout the county. And I'm very proud of this, these initiatives that uh, Lori and I have talked about and we have worked very hard to, to start implementing. Um, and I was gonna tell you about a few of those. So we are working on, uh, uh, we have a restorative justice case review team in our office. Uh, we have uh, uh, some investigators and some deputy DAs who are designated to any case uh, that may involve an officer involved shooting. Uh, the same with any case that involves uh, a use of force. Uh, uh, I, and the same with cases involved uh, CDCR or prison cases. We, 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 we ask deputy DAs uh, to be a part of these case review committees where they will get together with an investigator or the law enforcement making a referral, we'll assess those cases. Everything is on a case by case basis. Uh, we have a very uh, good uh, intern uh, outreach program. Our intern program was just recognized by the Board of Supervisors. Some of you might have saw that last week. I'm very proud of that. Uh, it were, they were recognized as intern team of the year for 2019 going into 2020. And in, in that light, uh, I organized, I reached out this, to the students who are law students, college students, and high school students. Uh, I had interns from Terrell High, Nevada High, uh, Jewish and Family uh, Children's Center, uh, 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 a couple of private schools. Uh, then we had college students. Uh, we had uh, law students who were coming to Moran from as far as St. Carlos and Redwood City. And there were 14 strong uh, in numbers, uh, ages 16 to 57. And uh, they actually st stood with his office going from the summer 2019 all the way up to the start of the pandemic in 2020. And they were so professional and dedicated in their volunteer assignments. We assigned them all over. They were out in the community, engaging the community with Lori and I and other deputy DAs that the, H, the Human Resource Department and the Board of Supervisors acknowledged them as intern team of the, rear, of the year. It was one of the first diverse group of interns in the history of the DA's office. I'm very proud of, I'm very proud of that. So we have collaborations going on with um, uh, the Career Explorers and the Probation Department. Uh, we have a Marin DA office, Community Engagement Outreach Education Committee. We have an Immigration and Relief and a U Visa uh, Case Review Committee. Um, as I indicated earlier, I coordinate all the diversity, equity, inclusion, outreach projects. We have, uh, I'll just give you an uh, example, we have a domestic violence and a, uh, a sexual violence uh, 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 case review committee. We have a mental health review committee. Uh, we have uh, the adult drug court and the mental health court. And just recently, as you probably heard, the Superior Court has started the Veterans Court, which Lori has uh, 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 put staff on it already. And she uh, took the, has taken the lead to really help support the court's effort to open that court. And we also started um, a DA website and social media uh, ad hoc review where you really, uh, you will see a lot of our posting uh, inside Moran and outside Moran, where we are uh, engaging and uh, showing the community uh, a lot of the things we're doing in that, in, that, in that light. So we have staff who have volunteered and expressed interest in support. And it's really great to know that we have 90, uh, approximately 90 people on staff here. And uh, uh, 
uh, I refer to them and, uh, as our DA family, our DA community. And they are great people. They are dedicated. And I'm, I'm proud to be working with them. And I'm proud to be one of the leadership with Lori Fregoli. And uh, another part, a program we, we launched is uh, uh, we just, uh, the county just hired recently, last summer, uh, the first uh, African-American uh, probation chief, uh, Mr. Marlon Washington, exceptionally bright man, exceptionally a uh, dedicated public servant. And with him coming on, uh, I decided to reach out to Marlon and I reached out to another distinguished colleague of mine, Mr. Dale Dangerfield. He's a, a senior um, public defender in Marin uh, for 25, 26 years. And I talked to those gentlemen and we three as African-American uh, uh, public attorney representatives decided that we wanted to start participating with each other uh, as panel guest speakers where you, for the first time, you will see an African-American prosecutor, public defendant, probation officer on the same speaker panel, uh, uh, panel. We're talking about the justice system, addressing the new laws that just came out. And we're gonna start a series of conversations in the county called Know Your Rights. And we're going to uh, go throughout the county speaking about some of the new uh, California legislations that are impacting the justice system and how our respective offices are working together or some of the uh, uh, changes that we foresee are coming. It'll, it'll be a great conversation and a great opportunity to listen in. Once you see a flyer of the three of us posted, it, it will be really good for you to uh, be a part of that. So um, I'm, uh, if there's any questions, I mean, I, again, I thank you all. Allow me may, may I ask a quick question? Could could I invite you to talk about another um, area that you successfully collaborate in, and that's clear my record. Um, you and the PD's office and the courts um, continue to be successful in, you know, doing a lot of work at a time when you know the court didn't have a lot of of bandwidth. And yeah. tell us a little bit on your side what that was like. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, thank you, Denise. Yes, uh, Lori and I uh, really, really uh, brought in a couple of uh, legal interns, uh, some certified law students, and they were, they were actually a part of the, the, the intern team. And uh, we still do that now, looking at the petition for expungement relief and the petition for sealing records. And uh, uh, there was a great effort to uh, work with the probation department to review those expeditiously uh, as possible and really uh, sign off. What you can have uh, sometimes is someone will say uh, they can uh, start an expungement project through a nonprofit community. Well, nothing really happens if the DA doesn't sign off on that, those expungements. So we have a, 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 a system here where we really are open minded transparent and try everything we can to review these competently, professionally. Uh, if there's no challenge that needs to be made, we'll say no objection by the DA. If there's something that we think that the person needs to bring back to the court, uh, we will make that point in our, our response papers. But for the most part, the judges and the public defenders and our joint effort, we have expunged uh, hundreds of cases uh, yes. last year, I mean hundreds. And we're still going and we're still looking for ways to maybe add another paralegal to uh, with the legal support team that I coordinate to help uh, uh, justifiably uh, as far as a person record so they can move on with their lives and their families and their commitment to their families and communities and working and access to education. So everything is a case by case basis. But believe me, we are working in that lane to facilitate justice. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Susan. Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if, if um, we have any questions, um, if it's possible to communicate with you, uh, talk to you further. Um, I also do have some questions I could ask now, but. I don't know how much time we have. 
Yeah, yeah. And I, and I was telling Chris, uh, uh, Chris, uh, uh, Attorney Kirby and uh, Lori and uh, Denise that you know, I, uh, you know, I'm always open to to questions, general questions. I do not do not address uh, uh, cases that are in the, in the paper or right. cases that are open investigation. Right. Or those you know, people can respect that because you know there are the, as the, as the, the the whiteboard videos indicated there are laws and there's ethics. We have to do that to respect victims' rights, defendants' rights, the community's right to know, and an our ethical rights to follow the law. And so uh, I'm invited to speak many places, and I and I'm always humble and respectful that people respect me and not you know, uh, try to bombard me with a controversial question or put me on the spot. And it, it, it just really makes me feel good. And that's how I've been welcomed to the community. So you are- well, I would welcome. never do that. No, no, but you are always welcome Ms. Susan uh, on any day, any time, uh, especially as we ease out of COVID to uh, 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 come to the DA's office or call and try to make an appointment with me and Lori Fregoli and uh, just have a conversation. And, uh, and that's how things should be in your public uh, uh, DA's office. And Can I those... ask a quickie question? Yes, ma'am. Um, regarding the police um, departments in Marin, um, I'm just wondering who, what oversight do the various police departments have in Marin? Like if we have, uh, aside from going and talking to, to uh, say the the chief or talking to some of the staff, but who oversees each, the police department? If we if we have some concerns or um, you know everybody who has um, some kinds of important authority needs yeah. to be needs some oversight, and I'm just wondering who does that in, in for the police departments? Because I was looking at one point and I couldn't find it, so. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's uh, everything is uh, Marin County has this unincorporated area and the unincorporated areas are, are, are in the county jail and the county court security is ran by the sheriff. So, you know, uh, you can ask Bob Dole. He can tell you that, you know, uh, how you can always approach any of the chiefs of police or their other sheriff or their uh, lieutenants or captains and as a public servant and talk to them. But in, in the local cities, there the town, uh, many police chiefs are hired by the town council and the city councils. And, uh, you know, that's how that works. You know, I don't think like, in, if I'm not mistaken, not, Marin County doesn't have some of these civilian uh, uh, citizen review committees like they do in Berkeley or other cities. But, you know, there's a city council for Nevada, the city council for Tiburon, the town council for Tiburon. Those are the agencies that hire uh, the police chief and the, and the, and the, uh, uh, your uh, law enforcement service, the public safety officer, and those are the people who you want to address your concerns to, and most definitely go talk to your police chief. I think Marin County is that kind of community where we should have that, you know, a, a welcome opportunity for you to walk in and talk about any issue. And if there's something that evolves into something that they think they need to document and it causes an investigation that will end up in a report sent up to the DA's office, we'll see how that evolves. But so if there's a little funny business uh, within a city, you know, the city council and, and police department, just wondering, is that, does, does that move on up to the attorney general of the state or, or what? Well, I, I can't really answer that. <laughs> you know, you probably have to talk off, uh, off of that, uh, probably to research that. But if you go, they, they got a they got a city attorney in most of these places. They got a count uh, count a uh, town attorney in most of these places. They have a county council in Marin that represent all the 22 departments in Marin County, including the sheriff. So if you wanted to ask questions, and they will be able to tell you how to move things from one point to another if you don't think that your question or concern is being satisfied. Thank you very much. You're so kind, Ms. Susan. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, I, 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 I welcome an opportunity to speak again. 
uh, I mean, uh, um, any uh, any uh, relevant and positive uh, community-oriented topic uh, that you may want. Um, and if I don't know, I know somebody who does know. <laughs> Mr. Bruce, there's one more hand raised there by Jonathan. Hey. Hey, Mr. Hey. Bruce. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good, sir. Yeah. How are you doing? Um, good, good to see you. I just wanted to uh, echo um, what you were saying, and uh, I didn't, I didn't know that the um, uh, DA's office was so spread out of so many different, so many tasks and departments and all. Um, and uh, so I was I, everything from like record expungement, you know, and and uh, a restorative justice. I'm, I work with nonprofits that are working on those as well. Yeah. But I just wanted to um, remind you and tell everybody that uh, it's probably about seven or eight years ago there was a young man in uh, San Rafael who was having some issues, and. Um, uh, I worked, I believe, with the public defender, and uh, you worked on the case, and I got to stand up for him in court, and that really helped the case a lot. And I was, I was very help, uh, glad and and uh, for the way that you heard of that through court and helped that young man out because it really helped him a lot. Well, so I appreciate the work. Well, I mean, that see, that's right there. Is if if we can get more prosecutors to have citizens and say, you know what, there are people who push back in the prosecutor's office and law enforcement. But let me tell you something. You know, I like the way Otis Bruce, you know, he listens to everything that goes on in the courtroom. And that I do. But if someone walks in the courtroom and then there's an opportunity for the, the DA to look around the courtroom and, and the judge all, always say, what's the DA's position on this case? What's the DA's recommendation? <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. the defense make the argument, the DA makes the argument, then the judge is going to make a decision, but he wants to hear everybody's uh, position. Then he'll say, what's the DA uh, uh, position? It is a proud moment where, to have a, a district attorney or deputy, assigned deputy DA, to evaluate a case to the point where it realized prison is not necessary here. Jail is not necessary here you know, some type of restorative justice or some way to move this individual, encourage and support this individual to the mental health program, the drug rehab program, the restorative justice program. I, I, I as one of the leaders, am very proud when we can take the lead on that. And we don't wait for the public defender to say it. We don't wait for the county council or the judge to say it. We, if we know the right thing to do, and we have an opportunity within the law and effort to do it, we should do it. And that's a proud moment. So I appreciate you, Mr. Freeman, for mentioning a scenario without mentioning a case name, but uh, but that means that you, and I've seen you in the courtroom many times in, in supporting people, but I, I, I do pay attention who, who's in the courtroom. And the most important, who's in the courtroom representing the victim and who's in the courtroom supporting the due process right of, a, of someone who's been accused. That's important. That's just as important. Oh, yeah. Otis, I think we have one more question from Mr. Levine. Hey, Mr. Levine, how are you doing, sir? Hope you're on mute. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for your time and for enlightening us about the uh, district attorney's office. And I appreciate that we have a modern uh, we have a modern DA's office. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate you supporting and acknowledging that. And uh, and then I know we're at the close of time. You said seven o'clock. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I remember coming up through college. There was a there was an old Japanese uh, proverb that said, "Start on time, finish on time. People would talk to you more." So. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't want to hold you up. Uh, uh, anymore. I, I'm your public servant. I, I work with Lori Pagoli. Uh, we are proud to be two, uh, two of the leaders in his office, and we uh, are proud to serve you on every level as prosecutors representing the people in the county and in the state of California. And I thank you, Chris, Laura, and Denise, and all for welcoming me. Thank you. Thank you, Otis, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you so much for Thank all you're you doing. I missed seeing you in the hall, so this was great.
All right. May I take a moment to invite everyone back for next month, which will be a speaker from um, a national organization that's based in San Francisco called the Fair Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, for a county that faces a rapidly aging population, these folks do remarkable work. I invite you to come if you know someone who's going through caregiving issues, who needs some advice, um, who just might like to listen and talk about their situation with someone. Um, this will be next month um, in June, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. All right, thank you, Kylie. Uh, be well, stay safe. Well, no, we'll be out of COVID a little bit soon, so a blessing to you all. Okay. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye -bye.